In this video, we're going to look at higher order filters. And the first thing I want to do is motivate their use. Why wouldn't you just always use one pole filters or two pole filters? Let's look at the frequency response of a few low pass filters. Over here on the left, we have the magnitude of the transfer function plotted in terms of decibels. And here on the x-axis, we have the frequency plotted on a log scale. 0 dB corresponds to 1. So this means that the output voltage and the input voltage are equal. In other words, this is a low pass filter because all of these low frequencies make it through the filter, whereas the high frequencies are blocked. A first order low pass filter corresponds to a one pole filter. This circuit, for example, could implement such a one pole filter. This would be the input, this would be the output, and this would be the transfer function in decibels. Because of the fact that this is a base 10 logarithm and we have a 20 sitting in front of it, we're going to have 20 decibels per decade roll off with our one pole filter. You see, for every one decade, we fall 20 decibels. That's the nature of a one pole filter. You're not going to be able to fall off more or fall off less. All one pole filters fall off at 20 decibels per decade. On the other hand, maybe a one pole filter is not enough to meet our needs. What if I had a signal right here that I needed to pass through the system and I needed to block a signal at this frequency right here? I hope you can see from the plot that a one pole filter is not as good as a two pole filter. Although a one pole filter is supposedly a low pass filter, which then blocks the high frequencies, the high frequencies are not completely blocked. They're just attenuated. And the amount of attenuation is related over here to the gain on the left side of the plot. A two pole filter has more attenuation attenuation compared to a one pole filter. So if you need more attenuation or more blocking of those higher frequencies, then you have to use more poles. How would you implement a two pole filter? For example, could I just add another inductor in series with the one that I had in my one pole filter? Well, no, that wouldn't work because if you have two inductors in series, mathematically, that's the same as just having a single inductor. A single inductor in a circuit will just give you one pole. To make a two-pole filter, I need to have two reactive elements that are somehow not mathematically combinable in the circuit. For example, this is one potential way to implement a two-pole filter. We can see that for high frequencies, they're kind of blocked by the inductor as they try to make their way through the circuit. Then those high frequencies that do get through the inductor are shunted down to the ground by the capacitor. Both the inductor and the capacitor are working here in order to block off those high frequencies. Of course, this is not the only potential arrangement of inductors and capacitors in order to implement a two-pole filter. There are other ways of doing it. No matter how you arrange your circuit elements, as long as you have two reactive elements and they're not mathematically combinable, you'll wind up with a two-pole filter. If it's a low-pass filter, then as long as you're far enough away from the corner frequency, you're going to get a roll-off of 40 decibels per decade. You're going to get 20 decibels per decade per pole. So the more poles we have, the more our filter's frequency response resembles that of an ideal filter. This more beautiful shape or more perfect shape in the filter's frequency response comes at the trade-off of needing more components to build the filter. Although there are several different ways that one might arrange the inductors and capacitors and resistors in order to build higher order filters, I wanna show you one particular way that always works so that you'll know how to stack up the inductors and capacitors in order to make these higher order filters in such a way that it'll always work. If you want to make a low pass filter, you should use inductors in series and capacitors in shunt. This is called a cower form. So if you look at the circuit diagram at the top, you can see that we have an inductor in series, a capacitor in shunt, an inductor in series, and a capacitor in shunt, and so on and so forth. Arranging them this way will result in a filter where the reactive elements are not mathematically combinable. Each one of these inductors and capacitors will add one pole to your filter's transfer function. By inspection, we can get an idea of how the filter works. You see, for high frequencies, they can't get through this inductor. 
yet they get shunted down to ground through this capacitor. They can't get through this inductor, and yet they get shunted down to the ground through this capacitor. In other words, each successive component does something favorable to the frequencies that we're trying to eliminate from the filter. This filter blocks the high frequencies, but what about the low frequencies? Well, low frequencies don't have any trouble getting through that inductor. They're not really affected at all by this capacitor. They don't have any trouble getting through that inductor and yet they're blocked by the capacitor so they're not shunted to ground. So you can see that overall the low frequencies just zoom right through that filter, but the high frequencies get impeded at every step of the way. Because the first element here is in series, this is called a series-fed filter. If I have one of the capacitors first, though, the filter will also work. It's just called a shunt-fed filter rather than a series-fed filter. Because we have seven reactive elements here, I can conclude that this is a seven-pole low-pass filter. Let's look at the high-pass filters. Down here at the bottom, we have a capacitor in the series position and an inductor in the shunt position. It works opposite to the low pass filter. High frequencies have no trouble getting across that capacitor, or this one, or this one, or this one. However, the high frequencies are blocked by these inductors, so they don't get shunted to ground. In other words, the high frequencies just make it right through that filter with no trouble at all. What about the low frequencies? Well, the low frequencies are pretty much blocked by this capacitor. Then the low frequencies, they're shunted down to the ground by that inductor. They're blocked, shunted, blocked, and shunted. In other words, the low frequencies, they're going to have a big problem getting through that filter. That's why this is a high pass filter. It very easily lets the high frequencies through, but it impedes those lower frequencies at every step of the way. This is thus an example of a series-fed seven-pole high-pass filter. Of course, there are other ways that you could arrange the inductors and capacitors that would also give you a seven-pole low-pass filter. It's just that this is a very neat way of doing it because you can always just add a series element, a shunt element, a series element, and a shunt element, and you'll always get a filter that does the job. How about bandpass filters and notch filters? Well, bandpass filters can be made by using series elements followed by shunt elements, followed by series elements, followed by shunt elements. So you might recognize this as looking very similar to a two-pole bandpass filter. This also looks very similar to a two-pole bandpass filter. At one very special frequency, the signal will make it through this filter, but you see the inductor blocks the high frequencies and the capacitor blocks the low frequencies. There'll be one special frequency that makes it through that part of the filter. The same thing true with the shunt elements. The very low frequencies get shunted to ground. The very high frequencies get shunted to ground. But for one very special frequency right at the center of the passband, it'll just pass right over that shunt element. If we count up all the reactive elements, that is, we count up all the inductors and capacitors, we get 14. Therefore, this is a 14-pole filter. But a 14-pole bandpass filter is often called a 7th order filter rather than a 14th order filter. And that's because you have two different sides to the bandpass filter. A 7th order low pass filter would have this type of filter response. We would have 140 decibels per decade roll off because 7 times 20 is 140. A 7th order high pass filter, which is also a 7 pole high pass filter, would also have a 140 decibels per decade rise here just below the corner frequency. A seventh order bandpass filter would look the same, but it requires now 14 poles because a bandpass filter is a lot like a low pass filter combined with a high pass filter. So there's a factor of two difference when you talk about the order of a bandpass filter and the number of poles it contains. Let's now look at a notch filter. So a notch filter passes the high frequencies, passes the low frequencies, and blocks the frequencies right in the middle. And we can see that by inspection. The high frequencies are going to go right through that capacitor. They're going to go right through that capacitor, right through that capacitor. But they're going to be blocked if they try to get shunted down to the ground. How about the low frequencies? Well, the low frequencies pass right through that inductor. They pass right through that inductor. They pass right through that inductor. However, they're blocked from being shunted to the ground by the capacitor. This is a notch filter because for the very special frequency right in the middle or right in the center of the notch, it's going to be blocked by either the capacitor, the inductor, or the combination, and yet it's going to be filtered down to the ground through these shunts. If we count up the number of reactive elements in this circuit, we get one, 
two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So this is a 10 pole filter, but we have five poles on one side and then five poles you could say on the other side. So we call it a fifth order filter. So a 10 pole notch filter is a fifth order filter because we have five poles per side. A 10th order notch filter you could say is very similar to the combination of a high pass filter and a low pass filter. And in terms of the dB per decade, roll off we have half of the poles contributing to one side and half contributing to the other side so a 10 pole notch filter is also called a fifth order notch filter and it would have similar roll off characteristics as a fifth order low pass filter or a five pole low pass filter or high pass filter there are different types of higher order filters and those really depend on the frequency response. Of course, if you have all of the poles acting at different frequencies, then you could have very complicated frequency responses of your filters. But the usual engineering application is to have all of your poles acting together to improve the shape of your filter's frequency response. There are a few different names given to useful filters and I'll introduce them right here. We have a Butterworth filter, Chebyshev filter, Bessel filter, and elliptic filter. So the poles are arranged slightly differently with these different filter types. What I have here are pole zero diagrams. And you'll notice that with the Butterworth, Chebyshev, and Bessel filters, we don't have any zeros. But with the elliptic filters, we do have some zeros. These are just names, and I'll show you how to design these filters here in a moment. As you can see, these different filter types have different pole zero diagrams. They necessarily then have slightly different frequency responses. A five pole Butterworth filter has its poles in slightly different positions than a five pole Chebyshev filter filter or a five pole vessel filter. That will correspond to a slight difference in the way the frequency responses look. In a Butterworth filter, for example, the poles are arranged evenly around the left half plane. In a Chebyshev filter, they're arranged around an ellipse. In a Bessel filter, they're also arranged around an ellipse. What does the position of the poles have to do with the shape of the frequency response? Well, let's take a look at some examples. These are plotted here on a linear scale. On the x-axis is frequency, and on the y-axis is the magnitude response. Notice that with the Butterworth filter, we have a very flat response near the corner frequency of the filter. So this is a low-pass filter, but I want you to notice that it's just very flat there. In fact, it turns out that a Butterworth filter gives the maximally flat response near the corner frequency. So if you're trying to design a well-behaved filter that's very, very flat, passing the frequencies, passing the frequencies, and then starts to block them and it bends down in a very nice way, then design a Butterworth filter. Let me now draw your attention to the Chebyshev filter. I'd like you to notice the slope of the response here. You see, it's a little bit better than the Butterworth filter, but it comes at an engineering cost, and the engineering cost is ripples over here just outside the corner frequency. A Chebyshev type 2 filter will put the ripples down here, whereas a Chebyshev type 1 filter will put the ripples up here. Typically, as you might expect, the Chebyshev type 2 filter is often more useful. Finally, an elliptic response has an even sharper response, but as you can see, we wind up with ripples on both sides of the corner frequency. Of course, these are all plots of the magnitude of the transfer function. I haven't said anything about the phase. The phase is important too. And what the phase indicates, in a sense, is how fast the signals make it through the filter. What we want in general is for those signals at a high frequency to make it through the filter at the same speed as those signals with slightly lower frequencies. As long as they're both being passed through the filter, we want them to pass through the filters at the same speed. Well, that's related to the linearity of the response or the phase response of the filter. It turns out that the Bessel filter with its poles arranged around an ellipse that has the maximally linear phase response. That's good when it comes to the delay response, but in terms of the magnitude response, it's actually worse than the Butterworth filter that's shown here. So if we arrange these four filters in terms of phase response and the sharpness of the filter response, we see that the Bessel filter is the best when it comes to the phase, but the worst when it comes to the sharpness of the filter's response. The Butterworth filter gives us a very flat phase near the cutoff point, but the Chebyshev and elliptic filters give us sharper response.
In the next video, I'll introduce how to design higher order filters, and I'll show you that it can be done using something like a cookbook method. It's actually very easy to design higher order filters.